I'd like to say a word of welcome uh, to those back on campus, students and faculty who were not able to join us here this morning, uh, but have joined us via live stream, so we can all say hello to them uh, back there. Uh, it's tough being here on Windows in Minnesota, uh, but we uh, are so glad that you are joining us uh, remotely. And we look forward to questions uh, later on in the morning from here and from there. Serving as uh, moderator for our discussion this morning is Kevin Goodnow, who is a 1985 alum of Concordia College and a shareholder in the Fredrickson and Byron Law Firm, where he specializes in government relations, health care, social services, and tax policy. Prior to joining Fredrickson, Kevin served on the Moorhead City Council, the Minnesota House of Representatives, and as commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Thanks so much, Kevin, for, for being with us this morning. George Halverson is our speaker. George is an internationally recognized leader in healthcare systems, as all of you know. First leading health partners as president and CEO for 17 years, and then Kaiser Permanente as chair and CEO for 11 years. George developed both organizations as singular combination as healthcare, health plans, and care systems. During his leadership, both organizations were recognized for the quality of their care effective labor relations, diversity of hiring, and support of women in the workplace. George started or helped to start during his career health plans in Uganda, Jamaica, Chile, Spain, and Nigeria. He has advised governments of the United States, Great Britain, Ireland, Germany, Saudi Arabia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Russia on healthcare issues. George has served on more than 30 boards and commissions, including his current service on the Mayo Clinic Board of Trustees, and he is the author of numerous books. Books come from George almost by the day. He's working on three of them right now. Warren Buffett has called one of his books on healthcare the best healthcare book ever written. And I read his books. They are clear, they are concise, and they are on point. Currently focused on issues of development for children and on resolving intergroup issues, intergroup problems, and intergroup conflict. George is now the chair and CEO of the Institute for Intergroup Understanding, and he is the chair for California's first five commission for children and families. Who better to lead a discussion about building a culture of success than an exemplar in leading healthcare systems? a visionary advocate for our national well-being, an incisive author, and a counselor to nations around the world. Please join me in welcoming Concordia's graduate, George Halverson. Well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. I was just thinking my mother should be here. <coughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> my mother actually uh, went into labor on the campus at Concordia. Uh, so I was almost born at Concordia. <laughs> uh, she managed to get to the hospital before the birth, but my parents lived in the uh, student housing for the veterans. And there used to be a, a bunch of dorms on the edge of campus that the vets lived in. And they were living there at the time. My father was a student at Concordia, and, and uh, so I, my Concordia roots are actually probably about as deep as uh, roots can get. Um, and I, I love Concordia. I got a wonderful education from Concordia. I deeply appreciate the education I got at Concordia because I learned so much about such a broad array of topics. I really got a great grounding in political science and economics in English. Basically, the liberal, I, am, I could not be a stronger advocate for the liberal arts perspective because I've ended up in my career running seven different companies. I've been CEO in seven different places, and I have relied on that breadth of learning that I got in, from liberal arts education in all of those settings. And, and uh, the, I took debate at Concordia. My debate coach was Paul Duffery, <clears throat> and he was spectacular. I, mean, I that was one of the the most powerful learning experiences of my life uh, was to take debate uh, from Dr. Duffery. 
And, and I can still remember the horror that I had the first day of debate when I learned that we couldn't pick a side and defend it, that we actually had to defend both sides. And the learning process involved in defending both sides was incredibly mind-expanding. Um, it took me a couple of days to really recover. <clears throat> and I was actually offended um, when they first said that. But, but then I learned to put together the arguments on both sides, and, and that actually expanded my thinking significantly. So the combination of, of Concordia Liberal Arts and, and debate, I think, is something that I've always been grateful for. So I'll start with that for a quick comment. Second point, um, when you look at what the number one predictor is for who's going to be in prison at age 18, it's not the race or the ethnicity or the income level. It's actual, oh, those are very high predictors. It is the number of words in a child's vocabulary when they get to kindergarten. The words and vocabulary of kindergarten are the best predictor for who's going to be able to read, for who's going to drop out of school, and for who's going to be in prison. And the people who end up with the low numbers are 80% more likely to go to jail. And when you look at who is in our prison, nearly 80% of the prisoners either read poorly or can't read at all. And 85% of the kids in the juvenile justice system in this country either read poorly or can't read at all. So we, we've got a situation where people are doing badly, dropping out of school, being unemployed, and going to prison. And we have more people in prison than any country in the world by a factor of three or four. We have six times more people in prison than Canada per capita. And when you look at who's in our prison, the people in our prison are people who can't read. So when they finish the prison term, and they try to go out and get a job, they can't even fill in the job application. So the only economic infrastructure that supports them and accepts them is crime. So the gangs end up uh, as the recruiters for the people who can't read to go to prison. Recidivism rates range 50 to 70 percent. And so we've got a horrible situation. And when you go back down the pathway, now healthcare we managed to cut the, the death rate from stroke by half by working back upstream to figuring out what was causing the strokes and to intervene with people. We managed to cut the, de the death rate for heart disease by half. We cut the HIV death rate. So we, when you go back and look at those issues and look at the kids, if you go back upstream, we know that the neurons connect in children's brains in the first three years of life. That's when the biology happens. That's when the brain's develop. That's when the neurons connect. And they connect by the billions in that time frame. And kids who get brain exercise, if somebody talks to the kids, interacts with the kids, reads to the kids, in that time frame, the brains get exercised. And those kids end up with big vocabularies. They end up with a different life. And if you don't interact with those kids at that point in time, if that brain does not get exercised, the brain doesn't grow. Those connections don't happen. And the kids end up with hundreds of words in their vocabulary instead of thousands. And they really, the kids who get a lot of brain exercise end up with vocabularies 10,000 words or more, and it's literally a thousand or hundreds compared to 10,000. So those kids are doomed for life. So we have to intervene in those kids' lives in those first three years. We have to have interventions. And we're now at a point in the country where half of the births are into families that are reading on average under 30 hours between birth and kindergarten. The upper income families are reading between to the kids between birth and kindergarten 1,000 to 1,500 hours. And the people who are um, having the majority of births in this country right now are actually reading under 30. So. We need to help all of those mothers. We did some surveys. I chair a commission for the state of California, a commission on children and families. And we did a survey last year, and we, we took a look to identify how many mothers knew that they could exercise their child's brain and give them a stronger brain. And we found no one that knew that, which is it's a fascinating piece of science. And most parents believe 
that when your child is born, the intelligence that they have the day they're born is intelligence they have to have for their entire life. And that's not true. It's not true at all. The intelligence you have at the end of the third year, those are the cards you play. So what you have to do is you have to help kids in those first years. So we started through our commission educating the state. We're running ad campaigns. We're, ed we're working with the um, doctors. We're working with the pediatricians. We're working with the OBs. We had a summit last week, and we had uh, 900 education leaders from the state of California come together in Sacramento for a couple of days to learn the science. We brought in brain biologists and taught the science to all of the education people because we need everyone in education to be recognizing the fact that those schools aren't going to succeed unless the kids come to school learning ready. And so they're very much on board, and we, we ended the session with the superintendent of schools on one side of me and the, and the person who is the head of all welfare programs, uh, commissioner of the state of California, and the other. And we're committing in the course of a year to flip that number from 0% of the mothers who give birth in California knowing about the ability to exercise their kid's brain to 100% of the mothers knowing it. So we're going to try to get to every surround sound, public media, uh, caregivers, the entire continuum. We're going to make sure that we give something in the hospital to every child or to every mother as the children are born, and we're going to try to get that information to everyone because when... The mothers know this information. All the mothers love their children. Everybody cares about their kids. Everybody wants their kids to do well. Everybody really wants their kids to succeed. And they don't know that there are things they can do that really make a difference. And so our goal is to have 100%, flip it over from 100% not knowing to 100% knowing. And then there's all kinds of other things we can do to help. We can get books. 61% of the daycares for low-income kids in California don't have a single book. Not one single book. And so we need to get the books out. We need to do book distribution, but we need to start in a very respectful way by informing the parents. And I think we've done the parents a huge disservice by not telling. And if you look around the country at the situations where there's significant differences, learning differences between groups, you can go back upstream and every one of those learning differences, <clears throat> they're not genetic, but they are biological. And they're biological because the brain did not get exercised in those key years and key months and years when you really need to do the exercise. So <clears throat> that's one of the things that I'm working on now. I'm chair of that commission for the state of California. It's a four-year appointment, and I'm just um, getting into my finishing my, my second year. Um, and our goal is to have this be something that changes the way California deals with kids. So I mentioned that as a first topic. Second point to mention is <clears throat> I've, I've had the good fortune of being CEO of one company or another, as I said, for a little over three decades. And one of the things that I learned a long time ago is that we are all creatures of instincts. We are very instinctive uh, creatures. We, we are instinctively hierarchical. We're instinctively territorial. We're instinctively tribal. We have maternal instincts that are very powerful instincts. Uh, the instincts that we have drive and shape our lives. We set many of our goals and develop many of our values in the context of our instincts. And our instincts are served by our cultures. We instinctively create culture. Every group of people will form a culture. If you get eight people to stand in a line they will form a culture for the line with the rules of the line. Can you cut in? Can you walk out? I mean, we are so rule-bound and culture-bound that we invent cultures for everything. Every college has a culture. Every group of any kind has a culture. <clears throat> and the cultures have expectations about what we should and should not do in that setting. We tend to self-reinforce the cultures. So our instincts set the direction that we're going in, and our cultures then articulate how we get there. So we have hierarchical instincts, and every culture invents a hierarchy. Every culture picks who's going to lead the culture, what the process is. We have territorial instincts. Every culture creates the rules of turf. How do we own things? Who owns what? So we all <clears throat> use the cultures to, to fulfill our instincts. So what we need to do at this stage of our uh, 
history as a nation is we need to make the choice to do enlightened things together and to use our cultures as our tools to achieve the enlightened behaviors and factor the instincts into the process because we can never be free of our instincts but we can channel the instincts in intelligent ways if we make that choice. So we need to flip it over from being driven by our instincts <clears throat> and directed by our culture and having the intellect serving as a servant of the other two to having our intellects at our direction and then use a culture as a tool and have that channel the instinct. So we need to flip it over. So one of the books I'm writing right now explains how to do that, explains how we take that process, flip it over, and turn our intellect into the driving factor for our lives so we can make decisions about ourselves and achieve those enlightened um, approaches because we put in place a toolkit to achieve that. Now, in, in my CEO jobs, one of the things we've done is we've set cultures and companies. A lot of people say cultures trump strategy. Well, that's true if you just let the culture happen. But if you know what you're doing, you take the culture and have it serve the strategy and serve the direction of the organization. So you identify what culture you want in a setting. You identify the values. You identify the rules, <clears throat> the regulations. You identify the heroes of the culture. And then you articulate the culture in that setting. And when you do that, the culture ends up, if you're a leader of the setting, ends up adopting that culture, and that culture then becomes the driving force. And it's like management by remote control because the people in the organization know what your strategy is. And if they are attuned with your culture, then when people make the day-to-day -day decisions that they make every day, people make those decisions in that construct. That's the context. Because people have to make day-to-day -day decisions in their jobs. That just That's a fact of life. They have to have a context to do that in. And they either do it in the context of their own values, their own strategy, and their own belief system, and sometimes that'll be good and sometimes it won't, or they make the decisions in the construct that you create with the culture and the overall strategy, and that's management by remote control. So if you want to manage a place by remote control, combination of strategy and culture actually gets you there. So at Kaiser Permanente, um, 200,000 people in the organization, about 50 billion in revenue, so we had good resources to play with to, to do things. But we ended up in that setting um, <clears throat> being number one in consumer reports. We were number one in J.D. Powers uh, for the nation. Um, Medicare set a standard of looking at 55 measures of quality and service, and they rated health plans on a scale of one to five stars, and they gave the health plans that had the highest scores five stars. And out of 500 health plans in the country, they gave 11 plans five stars. Eight of them were Kaiser Permanente. So we ended up sweeping the five stars for Medicare, and we did that with a combination of strategy and culture. We had a strategy that put the right pieces in place, but we had a culture that made those pieces work. And I'm going to give one example, and then I think we're going to have time for uh, questions and answers and some other comments. So when you look at putting a culture in place, you have to figure out what's the current culture? What are the values that people have now? What are the shoulds and oughts of this setting? What do people self-reinforce with one another in the setting? And then what do you want the values to be? What do you want people to decide? Should, should we be about the patient? I mean, some healthcare cultures are about incidents of care. Some healthcare cultures are about the patient. So we decided we needed to be about the patient. We needed to be about the patient. We needed to be data-based. We had to have science as a major driver, and we had to be data-based in our thinking. And we needed to be process-based. We needed to figure out what are the right things to do and how do we get continuously better. So we put in a culture, a very deliberate culture of continuous improvement. Uh, we use Dr. Deming's continuous improvement models, which basically says you figure out what the end should be, and then you figure out the best process to get to that end. And instill that culture in that process, and then put that, that toolkit in place. And we ended up with a culture where people actually did get continuously better. So we took a, an issue like sepsis, where sepsis is the number one killer. People don't know this usually, but sepsis is the number one killer of people in hospitals. 
Sepsis kills more people than heart disease, cancer, any other condition. And if you focus on sepsis, and most healthcare organizations try to respond to sepsis as each patient happens, but they don't do it in a systematic way, and they don't do it in a programmatic way, and they, they uh, don't do it in a way that's focused on improving the outcomes and measuring the outcomes. When we started, we didn't even know what the sepsis death rates were in our hospitals. We had to go through and, and check by hospital. Then we identified what we have 33 dozen hospitals. We identified what the sepsis death rates were in each hospital, and then we started figuring out better and best practices, early identification, responding to the patient immediately. Um, we ended up putting processes. There's a golden hour on sepsis, and if you respond to the patient within that golden hour, you cut the death rate in half. Um, but if it takes an hour to treat the to get the drugs or two hours to get the drugs that you need to treat the patient, then you lose the golden hour. So we change our system so that when the sepsis patient was diagnosed, they immediately delivered, made that a priority for delivering the drug. <clears throat> and the first change we made was to, instead of having the first in, first out prescription filling, we said if anybody has sepsis, that's first filled. And then after we did that for a while and cut the death rate by quite a bit, and we said, why do we even bother to go through that process? Why don't we just have the right sepsis drugs for the number one killer in our hospitals on the floor where the patients are so that we don't have to call the pharmacy and have them assemble the kit? Why don't we just have them prepackaged on the floor, cut the death rate in half again? I mean, it's that kind of systematic thinking. If you take a look at what the pieces are and what the processes are and arrange the process based on the end, and because we had, <coughs> excuse me, because we had a culture of people who really wanted to get better, were part of continuous improvement. When they cut the death rate to 25 percent, they said, "How can we get it better?" Then it went to 20, then it went to 15, then it went to 10. The death rate on sepsis is now under 10 percent of the patients at, at KP hospitals, and I don't know what it is today, but it, it's good. But I, I do know that um, a year ago, as I was leaving. Each of the care sites was keeping track of how many minutes it took from the diagnosis until treatment for each patient. And when you start doing that, then you start getting competitive about, you know, they're getting it in 50 minutes, we can do it in 45 type of thing, and you get re-engineering. So the point I'm making is you change a culture and you change a process, and, and I'll give one other example and then um, go to closing, but um, pressure ulcers. Now, pressure ulcers, most, many patients in hospitals get pressure ulcers. A typical hospital has 5 to 10% of the patients get a pressure ulcer. At KP, we said, um, there are things you can do to prevent pressure ulcers. Let's get really good at that. And so we were down at the low end of the continuum, the, the 5 to 10% continuum. We started measuring them. We were around 4. So we started figuring out how do we identify patients who are getting a pressure ulcer. How do we prevent a pressure ulcer? We changed bedding. <clears throat> we changed exam time. We, we did a whole series of, of things. Incrementally, with different caregivers all over the place, each inventing good things to do and then sharing what they invented. And so we, we took the pressure ulcer rate down to 4%, 3%, 2%. Um, a year ago, again, when I left, it was under 1% across all 37 hospitals, and half a dozen hospitals didn't have one single pressure ulcer in the year before, not one. So everyone else in America is having 5 to 10% of the patients. They kill people, they disfigure people, extremely painful, it's not a good, you don't want a pressure ulcer, and we had half a dozen hospitals. That was a combination of process and culture. Because the caregivers in that culture said, that's not going to happen on my shift. That is not going to happen on my shift. That, that This is my patient. I'm accountable. I care for this person. And there's not going to be anyone on my shift that has a pressure ulcer. With that commitment, they did all the right things in an almost obsessive way and got the, the outcomes that they got. You couldn't have gotten there by science. You couldn't have gotten there with a memo. You, couldn't have, you had to have a, a culture of people who believe in that. And then you have to have the culture supported by the right science and the combination of that. So it's a really good thing to do, 
to figure out what culture you want. It's particularly good to do in a healthcare setting. And when you put all the pieces together, if you have a strategy that identifies where you're going and you clearly communicate that strategy to everyone, and then in addition to the strategy, you have a culture that is aligned with the strategy that has people working toward your values, a combination of that can be very useful and powerful. So I advocate that. And, and the um, service scores with consumer reports rated KP number one, that was based on people having a culture of service because we said we need to treat every single member and every single patient as though they're our family. We need to treat everyone the way you would want a member of your family treated if they were getting care here and made that the culture instead of, oh darn, here's another patient. And again, culture works. So um, <clears throat> with that, I'll, I'll uh, end and we can have a conversation. So, thank you. George, that was interesting. And just so everybody knows, um, we've got a mic, roaming mic out here. Um, and then we're also going to be taking a question from our students in Moorhead as well at some point. Um, so if you have questions, um, just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Um, and it, just to get us started, that was um, the whole idea behind the culture. And you set the culture, then you're, it sets the motion of your um, organization. Yep. Um, you've, you mentioned that you've ran, run a lot of organizations. Yes. What was your biggest challenge in bringing that cultural change or to, to an organization? I think once I figured out how important cultures were and identified the fact that cultures were belief systems, basically paradigms, um, once I figured that out and started doing it systematically, it wasn't hard. It was much harder when I would say, geez, I wish we had a better culture here. <laughs> Darn, I, you know, or send out a memo um, everybody should be good to all of our members. And, and sending out a memo, and people read it and say, oh, you know, here, here comes that memo again. Um, <clears throat> but it, it didn't make it. So the hardest thing was to realize that a, a culture is something you could change. And, and then once you change it, you have to repeat it. You have to articulate it. You have to be absolutely clear in what the, the values are. Because if you're not clear, you have to be clear and you have to repeat yourself over and over again. You have to be so repetitive that you hate uh, saying it and then you have to say it again because you need people to understand what the basic values are and then you need to reward those values. When somebody does something that fits the values, you need to salute them, you need to recognize them, you need to thank them and recognize them publicly in front of other people. And then you also need to enforce the values. So if you have values that say we're not going to have sexual harassment in this setting, that's just not going to happen then you have to enforce it and you have to fire the people who do those behaviors uh, because people will listen to what you say and then will look to see if you actually mean it. And if you don't mean it, then you get a lot of cynicism and, and you even get some backlash. But if you actually say it and mean it and enforce it and reward it, um, so it, it, it's a major part of the job. It, it's not something that you do just as a um, let's do cultures on you know, the first Monday of every month or something. It, it's really a, a critical part of your job and you need to, be, and you have to model it. If you say that, um, that uh, I'm not going to, I don't want people to be jerks, and then you reward jerk behavior or you act in jerk-like ways, then again, you get cynicism and, and backlash. So you have to model it. But the, the hardest thing was to figure out that it wasn't something that just happened. Okay. And, you have to, and you have to walk the talk. And you have to walk the talk. You have right. to walk the talk. Okay. We have a question over here. I really appreciate your comments on culture and uh, the role and interplay between culture and strategy. However, I'd like to ask a question that draws on your experience running an integrated managed care organization. Um, the Affordable Care Act has some health uh, cost containment portions to it, but it doesn't really appear to be enough to control spiraling health care costs. In your opinion, what needs to be done to uh, contain health care costs? Yeah, the Affordable Care Act actually has um, 82 care shells in it. It actually has a lot more care direction than people know about. It has information in it about, for the first time ever, hospitals in this country are reporting their infection rates, for example. Um, 
the right the uh, package has computerizing hospital data as as a goal and meaning meaningful use data. There's a whole bunch. There are many many parts of the bill that are actually focused on improving care that people don't know about that have been below the radar screen. And um, some of the, and I think the death rate and some of the healthcare costs in this country have dropped because we've actually done a better job. And uh, we've had fewer people going to the hospital in the last couple of years, in part because all of the hospitals who now are um, both getting paid and penalized for not having the, the right safety levels are changing behavior. So we're, we've actually seen a flattening of, of cost that's, I think, a uh, spillover from that. Uh, but the, to really go where we need to go, we need to change the way we pay for care. We have to pay for care by the package. We, we've got to start buying care by the package and not by the piece. Because when you buy care entirely by the piece, when you just get a piece of care, piecework model has many flaws. And one of the flaws is that it encourages just straight volume or whatever that piece is. So you get a, you get a volume incentive. The second thing is when you pay by the piece, you actually incent people to do a bad job because you get more money for heart attack than not preventing a heart attack. You get more money for a congestive heart failure crisis than preventing it. You can prevent half the congestive heart failure crises. You can prevent over half the asthma attacks. But if you only get paid for the asthma attack, nobody prevents them. <coughs> and that hasn't been added to the, the model yet. We have to change the model so people get paid for preventing asthma attacks and not just for having asthma attacks. And so there, there's a financial piece to, for us to really get where we need to go as a country. We need to start buying care by the package in, in a really responsible way and stop <coughs> buying care by the piece. The other problem when you, when you buy care only by the piece, <coughs> you can re-engineer care. Kaiser Permanente has more MRIs and CT scanners than probably anybody in the world. We've got a huge number of them. But we only do one scan per patient. The rest of the world will do a scan in first setting, in the diagnostic setting, then do another scan in the hospital, then do another scan. And every time they do a scan, there's another bill. And your science hasn't gotten any better, and your information hasn't gotten any better. The patient's been inconvenienced. But it's hard to engineer one of those scans out of the loop because all three of those sites were making money from the scan and none of them are going to give up the revenue. So when you buy a care by the package, then you only need the right number of scans, not two unnecessary scans. And so we have to re-engineer the model uh, to change the cash flow to get to the, the right end game. Okay. As we're, other questions out there? As you're looking for somebody else who wants to ask it, um, I've got another follow-up is, what, what, you talked about how you implement the cultural change. You have to do more than just send out a memo. Right. Um, how did you develop the culture that you wanted to um, impose or, or bring to the bring to your organization? Is it just something that you woke up one That's morning and said, this is what I want to do, or did you have a plan on how to develop that? That's a good question. It was sort of an evolutionary process. I mean, I've been doing culture change. I, I worked at Health Partners, and, and we did a lot of work that was very explicitly focused on the culture of Health Partners. and, and in getting the change. And, and um, the values, when you have to sit down when you get to any organization and do a diagnosis of what the current culture is. So on key issues like honesty, cooperation, database decision making, um, process improvement as a value, and, and key issues like that, you have to do a diagnosis and say, where is this organization on that continuum? How is this organization doing? Do we have any continuous improvement processes going on? If so, what are they? And if you've got them, you can build on them. If you don't have them, you've got to put them in place. So when, when I got to KP, I sat down and, and said to the board of directors after I'd been there a couple of months, here's 10 elements of our culture today, and here's where they're going to be a couple of years from now. And right now, KP, when I got there, was extremely secretive internally relative to data. Uh, there was no data, internal data sharing. In fact, there were obstacles because there were history issues, political problems in the past, all the kinds of things that caused people not to want to share data become part of the legacy, and that becomes a culture. So you, you have a culture that we don't share data. So we said we have to get to a culture of absolute transparency if we're going to do things like we're going to do on 
pressure ulcers. And so how do we get there? And so then you have to do a number of steps, including creating trust on the part of the people reporting the data that you want the data to improve care, not that you want the data to, mm -hmm. as a gotcha tool, to get anybody, to, to punish anyone. And so you have to create trust around the data. So part of that was teaching, preaching, giving examples, um, modeling, and, and then again, taking something that was a win. Uh, we, we took a win and we cut the number of broken bones by 40% in our seniors by identifying all the high-risk seniors and then uh, intervening one-on-one -on -one with the seniors. Well, we cut broken bones in a senior by 40%, that's huge. You know, 25% of seniors who break a bone die within a year. I mean, it's actually a, a death issue and, and we had a huge reduction, but we did it by identifying everybody at high risk and then putting in place coaching and the right prescriptions and a whole series of things. But then, in addition to doing it, we celebrated it. We talked about it to all of our employees. We talked about it to all of our caregivers. We said, look what we did. This is who we are. We're the kind of people that can do this kind of thing. And we can do these things systematically. We can do them programmatically. And we use it as a teaching model and an example. And when we use it as a teaching model and example, then other people, because people learn by stories. People learn by anecdotes. And, and so if you can tell an anecdote, we did this, and did that, and now I wonder what we could do over in these topics. And then you start expanding to other topics. And we actually had the HIV death rate at Kaiser Permanente is the lowest in the world. And only the, the VA does a, a pretty good job. Um, but we basically focus on eight, the, the death rate is lower than it is from other chronic conditions right now at KP because we focus on every patient and we have systematic care plans. And when we started the process, we had different data by um, <clears throat> different outcomes by race and ethnicity. And when we put in, we put in an electronic medical record. We spent $4 billion on electronic medical record. We put that in place to make sure that we had all the data on all the patients all the time. And then we broke the data out by race and ethnicity by site. So I could tell you what the asthma control rates were for African Americans in Sacramento versus African Americans in San Diego versus Honolulu. And when we broke that out, we discovered there were significant differences. I actually wrote a book about ending healthcare disparities in America that you can get for like five bucks on Amazon. But uh, <laughs> and all the royalties from my books go to the community clinics of Oakland. So if you, if you buy a book, uh, the royalties go there. But um, we, we basically focused uh, systematically on what we needed to do for each of the HIV patients and we discovered that the death rate was twice as high in our African American HIV patients as it was on the white patients. And so we sat down and said, why? What's going on there? What are the issues? Is it biological? Is it behavioral? Is it care system? And we figured out better ways of coaching, better ways of teaching, better ways of, of controlling. Uh, better ways of reinforcing. And we actually got to the point where we not only had the lowest death rate in HIV in the country, but it was as good for the African American patients as it was for the white patient. We actually got, we, we, ne we zeroed that gap out. And uh, feds gave us a lot of recognition a couple years ago for doing that. Held a press conference in Washington, the secretary was there. And, and then we shared our protocols with the world. We shared our protocols with everybody and said, everybody else can do what we're doing, here's what they are. But we did that because it was a, a system. We succeeded because we did it systematically. But then again, we celebrated that. We really celebrated that with all the rest of our staff. And people feel good about working for a place that's doing a really good job. People like to take pride in the organization. So if we celebrate what we're doing in one area, then people say, kind of a reflective glow, oh, that's me. Um, so. Okay. Well, I have, I have a ton of questions, but I'll let yeah. other people ask some questions too. Sir, do we? Yeah. I just wanted to check. Do, do we have somebody from a uh, question from the students? Yeah. Okay. Why don't we go there? Um, so you talked about the work that's being done in California um, to help educate mothers on how they can help develop their children's mm -hmm. uh, brain by educating them. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess Concordia viewers are wondering how this can be brought up to a national level and um, address this issue around the country because. It's great to address it in California, but there's obviously problems around the, or throughout the U.S. That's exactly right. We, we need the whole country uh, to be on this agenda. Right. Um, I, I talked about the fact that the, the Medicaid, uh, Medicaid mothers love their children deeply and really want to do the right thing for their children. And we discovered that the Medicaid mothers 
uh, over half of the homes of Medicaid mothers didn't have a single book. There, there's no reading going on. The, the amount of reading time is really low. The amount of time interacting with the children is really low. Um, the number of words spoken tends to be much lower, and so the kids have a significant deficit. One of the ways you build vocabulary is by having someone speaking to you and interacting with you, and different cultures have different approaches on that. But every single kid benefits when you get them to the right direction. And what we have right now is we have half the births in America are now in the population that has the highest potential risk going forward. So it's, it's more than just California. It's a national issue. And, and we need to get that information to every mother. We need to make every single state. We need uh, cities to work on this issue. We need care sites to work on this issue. We need um, a couple of cities um, are, are doing really good pioneering work and having their cities be the cities now where every mother knows about these issues and, and is supported in interacting with her children. So yeah, it is national. We, we have to get it to everybody. And we've got to do it quickly, because every kid we lose is a kid we lose. And every kid we save is a kid we save. And you can save them one at a time. That's the other thing. Anyone here, if you know anyone who has a young child right now, um, share this information. Share this information. Let them know that you can make this difference in kids' lives, that you, that you, can, um, you can change their life trajectory and you have to do it in those first months and years of life, but you can change the trajectory of a child. You can, any people in this room could volunteer to go to a, a child in that age and read to them every day, interact. And it's the daily interaction that makes a difference. So yes, we need to, we need to have a national, it needs to be a public health campaign. Everyone needs to understand it. And, and we need to make it something that benefits all kids. We have time for Thank one you. more question. <clears throat> well, we had a question down here. And so the message there is that you've got the information now. Take this information yeah. and do something about it. Everybody in this room is now accountable. <laughs> <laughs> We're setting the culture here. <laughs> Our last right. question right there. I have two questions. Is that okay? Well, it depends on how, how <laughs> yeah. long they are. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My first question is really as a consumer, and your story about sepsis is rather frightening. So as a consumer, is there anywhere I can go look to see the local hospital statistics and choose which one I want to be taken to if I get sick? That's actually important to know, and, and I do not, I should know this, but I do not know what the Minnesota status is on sepsis reporting. Um, so, but if it's not being reported by hospital, it should be reported by hospital because it really does make a difference. There are hospitals that, um, you know, 30% death rate from sepsis is the number one killer. And when, when it's positioned by the hospital, they always say, oh, this rare thing happened to your patient and, you know, your mother's dying of, of sepsis and boy, that's just such a rare thing. It's the number one cause of death. It kills more people than anyone. It's not that rare. But it's positioned as being kind of a an one-off sort of thing. Um, but yes, you should know that. I, uh, Minnesota sh should report that. And the other thing that's true is, once care, when we took our hospitals and we measured the sepsis death rate, we asked all the, all the caregivers and all the hospitals, do you know what to do? And the answer was, everybody knew what to do. Everybody knew the basic science. But none of them had the processes in place. And we had a huge range. We had you know, some hospitals that had 33% you know, of the patients dying. And then we had the best hospitals at the beginning were about 25%. And we brought the whole thing down to under 10. But the hospitals shared information with each other. But the hospitals that were worse, actually, I could have put them up with a lie detector and they would have passed absolutely believing because they were well-intentioned. And people think that well-intentioned is the same as good. Mm. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> so I'm going to do one of those radio talk show host things. You've got. A quick, you can five seconds to ask the question, <laughs> 30 seconds to answer it. Go ahead. Oh, this might Sorry. take longer. Um, well, your financial model must be interesting because really you're not operating on a piecemeal basis. So, how did Kaiser permanently actually make money? Oh, Kaiser, KP does very well financially because <laughs> if you get it right, it's cheaper. But then you can't keep billing. <laughs> no, but we get, we get prepaid. Our members pay us a premium. 
<laughs> as I help partners, our members pay us a premium. You know, we get $2,000 a month from Medicare people, and we have half as many congestive heart failure cases. We have, you know, half, many fewer broken bones. It works. If you get paid by the package up front, then you can engineer care to make it better. And you're right. If we were paid by the piece, if we were paid by the piece, the things that we have done, we, we do 14 things for the HIV patients. Okay? Ten of them are not on a Medicare fee schedule. If we get paid by the piece, we couldn't do 10 of those things. We'd have a much higher death rate. So you have to get paid by the package. That's pretty close to 30 seconds. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>Now, the worst part of the job for me is it's my, my task to kind of cut the discussion off. So, as I said, thank you very much to, to George and Kevin. Let's put our hands together for today's fantastic conversation. Another thing I'm asked to do is just re I note a few things that are said that are probably lessons, I think, of leadership lessons. And for lots of years, I actually taught management classes, and I've used that whole, you know, culture trumps uh, strategy notion. It's sort of a maxim. And, and I've, with now a new addition, which is culture serves a strategy, which I think is, is actually a fundamentally different way of understanding the kind of tool. And often when you've talked about continuous improvement, and for many industries, that's been the, the model for 30 or 40 years. Uh, a number of folk in this room are in the healthcare industry and it probably hasn't always been the model typically that drove the way health was pr um, provided. But also there's lots of people here who are interested in how data drives decision making. A number of the organisations are really about that new wave of how data will d drive and change decision making across all industries. Interestingly, healthcare is one of them and the industry that we're in, education, we're, we're an old industry as well that often hasn't used data to drive what we do. Um, also, there was a one message, in case anyone didn't get it, read to your children. <laughs> and on behalf of our CLV friends, I think you'll find that people who have multiple languages are even in a stronger position. So if your children can become bilingual, so read to them in Spanish as well as English, uh, they're even in a stronger position. I do want to make sure that we thank the various people who helped put this t uh, event together today. We have a number of event sponsors, in particular Boulay Accounting, Fontas Investments, Minnesota Life, the Securing Financial Group, RDO Equipment Company and RDO Integrated Systems, Vigilance Intelligence. We have table sponsors with Banner Engineering, Norway House and US Bank. Also, when you came in, a number of you might have noticed we had out on the table there a bowl. Uh, and if you'd like to make sure that you stay in contact with the various activities that we do, just put your business card in there and we'll make sure that you're on our list. As many of you know, for over 40 years, Concordia's had uh, a program dedicated to preparing future leaders in the healthcare industry. And, and in the room today, there's actually several graduates of that program. Um, we think, in fact, we were probably the second institution in the country to develop an undergraduate program. Over the years, we added in components about long-term care and healthcare finance. I have a couple of the faculty from the healthcare program, including the newest member of our faculty, Shelley Gumpf, who is over here, so please make sure you say hello to Shelley. And also we have a number of students because uh, only the kind of special treatment that coppers get is after this event, George has gratefully uh, uh, said he'll be able to spend an hour or so with our students and we have a number of our healthcare management students and our nursing students who are going to get a chance to talk to George. Most of you would probably recognise as a 20-something year old, a chance to sit down in a conversation with George is literally a once-up. So we're thrilled for those students to have that opportunity. Also, I'd like to be able to announce our upcoming events. We have uh, the next year uh, the slate prepared for the upcoming Offit School Presents. And on the 22nd of October, our featured speaker will be Hubert Jolie. My 
bad attempt at a French accent, who's the president and CEO of Best Buy Corporation and the former CEO of the Carlson Group will be the featured speaker. Because this uh, location is actually booked on that day, we're going to be holding that in the Radisson Blue here in Minneapolis. And in spring 2016, our featured uh, guest will be Christy Morse. She's the chief executive officer and board chair of the Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, which has grown very rapidly to be, I think, the largest philanthropic group in our region. We hope that you'll be able to join us for those events. Also, putting something like this on as a team effort, I want to call out for special note uh, two members of, of my team, that's Carol Hedberg and Julie Lovin, and from the Office of Advancement, Kristen Bortman and Eric Johnson. Um, certainly they do all the work that actually puts this together. And finally, Bill mentioned that on a personal note, I've actually accepted another position in a university just out new, outside New York City, and Concordia is actually recruiting a replacement, and they would actually welcome your nominees. So if you know someone who would be credibly able to do this, and remember, I set a fairly low bar. <laughs> so almost certainly you'll find someone who can do a better job. Um, also, a number of you in the room have been critical in this last six or seven years as we created the Offit School. And I think I've said this before and I can never say it enough, we literally could have not have done it without you. So whether it's the wisdom of Norm, the resources that have been brought to the table, but just those very good ideas. So several people here uh, now, six and a half years ago, Pam Jolica and I came down here, had some early meetings with the young bucks from, from the Twin Cities who started to envisage what would become the Offit School. This is part of what it is, and, and thank you again personally and on behalf of the organisation for the support that, the ha that led to this, this opportunity. So thanks very much, everybody. Our students are getting together, and I'm not sure where the room is, but we're heading off somewhere. And thanks very much, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.